Yes, sir. So we are starting the second session. And we have started the recording. OK. Welcome back. Oh, sorry. Hello. 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 Welcome back. Ajimim Ashoka, can we start? Okay, 15 minutes, let me yeah. delay it. It's OK. I think the session will end at 1.45. Or I'll try to finish up before that. Do we start? Yeah. So welcome back. Now, uh, in the ses second session, I'll talk about the two fundamental routines that sustain life on planet Earth. The first one would be respiration. The second one would be photosynthesis. And I'm going to argue that the textbook paradigms that we study, we employ for research purposes, are misplaced. That's a fundamental grounding on which I'm starting. And from now on, my work is rather critical than advocative of my work because uh, that's because I have got enough argument and evidence to pull down the existing paradigm. And I have proposed a model. And it looks appealing. Majority of the available um, Observations it's explaining. But then science is an endeavor wherein you can disprove something with confidence. And proving is something more of a mathematical domain. You can disprove, prove difficult. So in these two talks, I will strongly go against the existent paradigm. And I hope that is considered acceptable to challenge very highly recognized paradigms. Please don't get offended if I say that some recognized paradigms are not uh, appealing to thermodynamics or something like that. It's okay. I am supposed to do that. My job is that of a scientist. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> so now respiration and thermogenesis. I start with a very hypercritical slide. What's wrong with chemiosmosis theory? This one was the flyer that I made for my talk at IAC in 2017. All right. Nothing if you see a cat below, if you don't come be a part of history. So this shows the critical outlook that I have at the outset. As I said, I'll be critical of the recognized explanations and that's where it's going to start. So here is the fundamental philosophy. A critic is a necessary evil and criticism is a new analysis. And I shall not shy away from criticism. So in the first part of the first session, I showed you chloroproxies. In the second part of the first session, I went on to cytochrome P450. I showed the similarities between chloroproxidase and cytochrome P450. And then I went on to the differences. And then I built on the plank of similarity between the two systems. Here, it's very interesting to see that the drug metabolizing xenobiotic, uh, xenobiotic metabolizing system that you have in liver, endoplasmic reticulum, it has got so many similarities with the mitochondrial oxfos machinery. Oxfos is oxidative phosphorylation. All right. So here, now I am building a paradigm. You should see first chloroproxidase, then cytochrome P450, a little complex system. Here you have a multi enzyme system, but then the components are very similar low amount of Levin enzymes, high amount of heme enzymes. Phospholipid interface, interface, nicotinamide, oxygen. Same components, right? In the endoplasmic reticulum system, in this system also. Now, mechanism in the prevailing model prolongs substrate binding, proton consumption, heme forms water via protein protein interaction, electron transfer, D ROS are del deleterious side products, varying stoichiometry, etc., were present in that system and it's also present in. This system. 
then experimental profile as a experimental scientist i got on the theory part much later but as an experimental scientist when you see some very interesting observations they all of the underpinning mechanism the one of the interesting observation here is how in the microwasoman system also if you just add nadph the the loss of redox equivalence is low but the moment you add xenobiotic boom it goes down remember the thermodynamic pulse slide right i told you one of the fundamental principles here you see the presence of a substrate is what depletes the redox equivalence similarly the presence of adp increases nadh conversion in my view the inference is here is a hydroxylating system here it's a phosphorylating system in chlorine in chloroprocidase it was a chlorinating system but in all these three i'll argue that it's a molecule ion unbound radical morbon all right so the similarity is established and also several sips like 1a1 1b1 2b1 2e1 2d6 are also found in mitochondria and also sometimes non specific phosphorylation of xenobiotics is also seen so all this also argue that this could be some morbon activity in mitochondria all right at the outset i'm trying to draw similarities now let us try to go before i try to break a theory or a break an explanation i try to introduce my audience to what the theory is what the explanation is now this is the kalin mitchell boyer paradigm kalin was mitchell's guru and boyer was contemporary of mitchell mitchell and boyer got the nobel for this paradigm okay it's the one that explains how the chemical energy currency of atp is made in mitochondria all right so uh here complex uh, it's like this uh, uh the components of the electron transport chain are so called electron transport chain it's a deterministic scheme electron transport chain is etc complex 1 complex 3 complex 4 the electrons are input into complex 1 and then electrons are taken from complex 1 by coenzyme q and passed on to cytochrome c and then from there to complex 4 what is the role of water in our respiration to make water oxygen is needed to make water at complex 4 i it's very funny that you need oxygen to make water right is i i find it very funny that and then these electron transport chain proteins are supposed to pump protons outward and then that is in turn supposed to create a positive gradient outside and a negative gradient a negative charge inside thereby necessitating a proton flow back inward where it drives a complex five which is a rotating more motor like function this is the classical textbook explanation so this is this establishment of gradient proton pumping and the rotary function this i shall call class chemiosmosis rotary atp synthesis i and I, i have a acronym for that i call it cras all right you can understand why i call it so etcm proton pumps are the other so in the in their theory nadh reacts with oxygen to make nad plus water plus transmembrane potential then adp plus pi plus this transmembrane potential somehow the transmembrane potential somehow is able to make the atp bond how yeah. somehow and then the dissipation of transmembrane potential leads to heat now you know what is the role of heat heat temperature increases you have increased number of collisions you know that's why you need to have your body at a higher temperature otherwise what will happen all the reactions will go down so heat production is important 
So this is the standard Kelvin Mitchell wire paradigm. And this is another representation of this with structural uh, information. You have the complex one, which looks like this, complex three, which looks like that, complex four, which looks like this, and the rotary protein. This is supposed to be rotor, uh, I mean, rotating. This thing is supposed to rotate. And these are the different equations. When they add up, it gives overall electron transport chain equation. And the, this thing was the original consensus. These many protons give this many ATPs. ATP molecules, but then later on the consensus changed to uh, 2.5 ATP per 1 NADH and uh, one succinate gives 1.5 ATP and this gives approximately 10 protons. This is the consensus. The consensus changes as and when they don't like it, they change. All right. So the Formation of ATP is supposedly at three junctures, if you see. And in the uh, electron transport chain, there are distinct redox potential bandwidths where in which and different um, uh, locations where ATP is supposedly formed. How is it that complex five can tap it at that? Well, nobody knows. This is the theory. I'm just trying to say that this kind of a, a proposal is like that. You know, hydroelectric power project, wherein you have water that comes in through the penstock from a reservoir, going through a turbine, generating power this way. This is this water that comes in can be equated to equated to what? Protons, right? Protons are pumped. Then the protons come in and they are pumped back again. The ETC job is to pump back. So this is like a gambit scheme wherein protons have to be pumped out first by three or four components and that single component of the complex five makes ATP. <clears throat> All right. It's a gambit kind of scheme. Or it can also be compared the functional modularity can be similar to a, how the when the wheel, the car goes around, uh, the, uh, the alternator charges the uh, battery. The modality can also be compared to that. ATP synthesis, charging of battery, uh, can be alternator can be compared to the proton pumps, so recycling logic, and electron transport chain can be compared to the engine burning fuel. So this is another aspect uh, of comparison. The, what are the problems with this? There's a fundamental problem with this. This, these two comparisons both are man-made. It's not spontaneously evolved. All right. And now, uh, please bear with me for the mockery. First, how many complexes for mitochondria? Approximately 10,000 to 1 lakh. All right. Conservative proton treatment since 10 protons give that you could approximately a million. How many protons in a mitochondria? You know, one mitochondria is a mi micrometer dimension organelle. It has got this much volume of water. Water dissociation, you know. You compute, you can do it. Any 12 standard person can do it. It's three or four at pH seven, around that value. It's practically aprotic. This was given over. There are hardly any protons to pump. How can this get up? Buffering rotus mechanism cannot justify needs. Evolutionary mandates. Vitally deterministic scheme, in irreducibly complex. You need four, three, four protons to pump protons, uh, proteins to pump protons. And then you need one complex rotor, motory protein to rotating protein to make ATP. How does it make all sophisticated ideas, which is unheard of before, unseen. Somebody said they got recognized and we are teaching it. That's what it is. And losing in gambits and mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, as per the textbook, it has very low efficiency. Substrate level phosphorylation that you see in 
glycosylysis that has even more efficiency, 40 percent. This one has much lower than that. Why this system should go through such laborious ways to make it like this? Then why why do we have ROS formation in mitochondria if it works through proton and all that? Why is complex five the ATPase which we studied? When you isolate, it is an ATPase. It is not an ATP synthase. How can it become an ATPase in the cell? It is an ATPase. So, these are the evolution aspect. Then, oxygen's role. Oxygen covers, it's a very mobile gaseous molecule. It covers approximately 10 to the power 3 angstroms per microsecond. All right? It's a diradical. It's a very strongly electronegative moiety. Now, molecule. Now, biological electron transfer between all these, sorry, these, these electron transfer steps and all these electron transfer steps between, there are so many uh, uh, dozens of electron transfer steps here. Now, they require microsecond time scales. So, it will easily, oxygen will be present practically everywhere at all the time. It will shun, it will, all this deterministic machinery, it will wear away all that. So, uh, this question um, uh, Chinmay asked, uh, why does oxygen mess with an anaerobic organism? If that is, the electron transport is so efficient and so se sense, uh, so selective and so particular, why should uh, oxygen mess with that? In anaerobic systems, if it is sensitive and specific, it is. Why should it? Then how can diverse probes donate and export, uh, uh, accept electrons to and from ETC? That's another question. Then varying and non-integral ratios. Some people said uh, uh, phosphate form per, per, per oxygen atom is 3.7, 2.2 for NADH, <laughs> like that. Different groups, different value. And same thing for hydrogen and phosphate uh, ratio, phosphor ratio. So the point is, if it is a deterministic, very well planned system, you don't expect such, such divergent ratios in divergent peak, then this is supposed to be a major success of Michelian model, that is dinitrophenol. Dinitrophenol is supposed to hop around the membrane, take protons and shuttle here and there. Now, if the membrane is not freely permeable to proton, proton is a small atom. Dinitrophenol, it has got negative charge here. This is OH, this is also charged. OH is deprotonated. So, phenolate. In that case, this has multiple charge. It has more, um, it's larger. Why should it go up and down across the Membrane relaying charges. That is another question. Architecture, structure, and distribution. Now, no modularity. You don't have uh, complex one, complex three, complex four being arranged in a specific range, and then complex uh, five making the protons in that. They are randomly distributed on the inner membrane. There is no arrangement, and the distribution of the different <coughs> complexes. Don't agree with the uh, stoichiometry that you expect in a uh, uh, electron transport chain kind of arrangement. And also, if you see the different complexes, I've just shown the matrix word extension of different complexes. There are pendulous parts of the proteins coming down into the matrix. Why are they? They don't seem to have any role in the classical theory. The structures of proteins are not explaining, uh, not explained. The distribution of proteins are not explained. Very importantly, thermodynamic and kin kinetic viability made an exhaustive comparison of the different uh, phases, reactions, and added up all in, in any case, it doesn't make. Each of the 15 intermolecular reactions 
wherein two different molecules have to come together and uh, transfer electrons. Two substances of 10 to the power 4 per second and two and 10 to the power 2 to 10 to the power 3 per second are required. Such an ordered sequential scheme, they are all ordered and sequenced in sequence serial. They cannot give 10 to the power 3 per second. It's a very simple argument that even using the classical school's computations, you try to reason out the thermodynamics and kinetics of the reaction, you can. And this is very seeing is believing kind of argument. Okay. Here is the transmembrane region of complex one. Here is the matrix region of uh, complex one. Here there are multiple iron sulfur centers and flavins and quinone, uh, uh, flavins here. The quinone is supposed to go in from here and collect the electrons from here. Quinone is a long chain molecule with a uh, isoprenoid tail with uh, two double bond oxygen on the, the six membered carbon ring. So the electron transfer supposed to occur here and the proton pump is supposed to occur here. Electron transfer is here, they are microsecond steps. Here, this is millisecond step. There is no physical continuity between these two. If one would imagine that from uh, NADS, the electron had to go to coenzyme Q, and at that time, proton had to be pumped, I would imagine flavin to give uh, one, uh, you know, a small stubby extension with the flavin taking and giving, and the redox centers should be placed like this so that the electron, when it goes, if there is a proton pump, we can have it like this. But the structure is completely different. The structure is wherein here you have diverse structures here, and the electrons seem to come, and the redox potential, they are not at all agreeing with the classical school. If you want this to go in this way from here to here, you would want minus 300, minus 250, minus 200, minus 150, minus 50, something like that. But that is not what it is. It is haphazard. And then there are redox centers which are not in the root. And then the coenzyme Q should go into the protein entry. So, and then these are the, this is the expected structure. This is a realistic structure. It doesn't agree. The reality is doesn't agree. Doesn't agree. Then the Q cycle. Have you studied Q cycle? Anybody? Q cycle, Q cycle, yeah. So Q cycle, if you know, one transfer of four electrons from uh, the uh, coenzyme Q to uh, cytochrome C, it requires 12 steps. And the electrons have to start and go back to coenzyme Q, that is ubiquinol. The uh, ubiquinol comes and binds, ubiquinol comes and binds, and the electrons have to start from ubiquinol and go back to ubiquinol, and one has to go to cytochrome C. That's what is represented here. And then interestingly, this large pendulous portion of protein has no role whatsoever in the classical theory. This has no role. It's just hanging there. All right. And this is complex four or cytochrome oxidase. It's just supposed to form water. Oxygen stays bound here inside, and then it's supposed to stay water, form water. And then complex four has got a KD of something like uh, uh, 10 micro, 30 micromolar range, whereas it has a KM of uh, of much lower. So KM, the theory, Michael is meant theory is KM is larger than KD, but then how is it? This equation doesn't agree with the theory. And then they tried, there are two heaves here. They tried to transfer electrons experimentally in the absence of oxygen and in the presence of oxygen. In the absence of oxygen, the rate was one per second, but only in the presence of oxygen, <clears throat> it was thousand percent. So, what does that say? In the classical theory, 
the electrons are supposed to go through the wiring within the protein by the Marcus outer sphere. But that is not what happens here. We don't have evidence for something. So, chemiosmosis is something like this. What Peter Mitchell said is when protons are pumped up, that creates a gradient, proton gradient. And then this also creates an electrical gradient. That is, I have um, uh, uh, I have taken out uh, uh, 100 rupees from my bank. That is, you use some energy to expend and pump proton out. When I do that, I took out 100 rupees from a bank. And then for that, the bank credited me for, with 300 rupees. That is the accounting here. That is, the electrical potential is built, which is more than the proton pumping energy that was in this. It doesn't make sense to me, at least. And then the ATP synthesis, then when you compute, it all adds up, does not add up to the experimental observation here. P by O ratios consistently exceed with 1.5 and 2.5, whereas the Nobel laureate John Walker says that it is 2.5. It's an imposition of a consensus over experimental data. Do you understand? Now, how can that? We are, as scientists, we are supposed to explain naturally observed phenomena rather than superpose our theory on an experimental observation. And then, of course, the rotary ATP synthesis, the miracle of an enzyme. It's supposed to go round and round and uh, rotates the components, alters affinity, pushes out the bound ATP. That's the Boyer theory. So, complex wise affinity for ATP is supposedly 10 to the power 7. That is 10 million times higher for ATP considered to ADP. What is the definition of an enzyme? Which one does it have affinity to? To the substrate or to the product? Substrate. Why is this? Why is this like this? Maybe one of the Leninger textbook says this affinity for ATP it is used to drive ADP synthesis. How? How? And Paul Boyer was the same person. When enzyme active site link theory was valid, he proposed phosphohistidine and published it in science. When that theory was valid, they can publish it in science, nature, whichever way they want. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I'm being a very political and perhaps cutting my own, uh, you know, prospects here. I'm hoping that you people start becoming critical. When uh, theories are floated, you should be able to question, how can a rotary enzyme exist? Have you ever come across any naturally self-assembled rotary machinery? Have you seen anything rotating in real life on its own? How can Something assembled like that. Did you question? And if at all it can, how can it have more affinity for ATP? And in reality, when you isolate complex one, it breaks ATP. It does not make ATP. They say that if you put it into the cell, somehow it makes ATP. All right. I don't know. Then if at all it can use TMP, it has to be a fluctuating TMP. When there is a potential, particular potential, it uses, it break, makes, and then the change. It cannot be a continuing things for that. It can harness like that. So then there are no redox or paramagnetic centers because we know rotary function is only in the electromagnetically inductive systems, right? Like what we have engineered. These are naturally observing uh, occurring things. How can proton that come in here go there? Why should a proton that came in cannot go back like that? Why? What is stopping the proton? And when you see experimentally, there is no potential gradient at all, pH gradient. There's no pH gradient. When Peter Mitchell proposed this, written chance uh, showed there is no gradient. There was no gradient. There is no gradient even now. He said the gradient should be inside out uh, 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 thousand folds. 
they settled for 0.1. That is because they wanted to see. It's really sad how this thing continues. Our younger generation is still taught. So, but then this has been demonstrated in single molecular experiment. Yoji, uh, Noji experiment. You know, they, now I can always put a knife in a pumpkin and then I can uh, put a windmill, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 air catching sail or something. I can blow and that will go round and round. But that doesn't mean that that is how it works right? in reality. You can show in single molecule experiments a lot of things, but does it have Now, reversibility. This is what I'm saying. Uh, this I've already talked about. So um, the experiment, they think that, uh, um, what's our uh, yeah. teacup breaking and Time, yeah, time, brief history of time. What's his name? Stephen. Yeah. yeah. He said that, right? So thermodynamics dictates the directionality of certain things, right? It's something that we like to abide by, form our theories based on the beautiful laws that the world, the nature gives us. Now you see what Leninger says careful measurements of the binding constant show that ATP with very high affinity. And the difference of KD corresponds to about 40 kilojoules per mole. ATP synthesis is 35 kilo. And this binding energy drives the equilibrium forward for the formation of ATP. If ATP binds with the high affinity. How does that binding affinity drive the equation to formation of ATP? How can anybody write something like this? Did you understand what I am objection with? We are, we need to have a mechanism for formation of ATP. All that it says is that it binds ATP with high affinity. So how can it, how can it allow us an explanation for the formation of it? It cannot. This enzyme breaks ATP. So what it does. That's why it binds to ATP at high affinity. And it breaks. It can. That high affinity can be used to break ATP, cannot be used to break ATP. If that is the case, all that ends, um, you know, um, sucrase, um, lipase, it binds the substrate with higher affinity. That is used to break, but that's what. So it's not just I go down this theory. Individual scientists with long standing, strong credentials. Edward Slater, the biggest name in uh, oxidative phosphorylation, Rainio, Gilbert Ling, I talked about, he died, he died. All these people questioned this theory even after it was accorded double. So, consensus drives the mass, doesn't drive scientists. Scientists are driven by Curiosity, yes. You don't, just because a hundred people believe in a random theory, you don't need to. If you believe in a theory, you should be able to justify it. Yeah, you bring one person from the, this school of thought and make them justify. No, I have put in the paper, every single part of this theory has been broken and every single part of the uh, aspect of that has been questioned. So the Murkorn theory that I proposed in lieu, now you can, I'm not going to spend too much time on each component of the protein. I'm just going to say what they do is basically all these matrix extending part, they have ADP binding sites, right? This milieu is high in phosphate, 10 millimolar. And so they have ADP binding sites. And these have redox centers, and what they do, they generate. So ROS attacks ADP and phosphate. They come together from ATP. Very simple chemical, bimolecular chemical. Did you understand the mechanism that I am proposing? Did you understand the mechanism? It's a very simple. It's an oxygen-centric mechanism. It's an oxidative 
phosphorylation. There is no proton pumping, there is no proton. What can you pump? Very simple, some stru sorry, structurally, you can easily explain the structures. The here, since NADH is the electron giver, NADH has only one hydrogen atom, whereas it has two electrons. So this system becomes proton deficient. The proton comes from outside. That is thermodynamically viable. That is electrochemically viable. And since Rosa superoxide is produced here, this becomes negative. It is not proton pumping that makes it negative. It is the effective charge separation and the formation of superoxide centered uh, radicals that makes it negative. That is the origin of transmembrane potential. And transmembrane potential is not harmless like that. And then, how does this now? You, you see ATP and water. Now, this pro, now you have more protons required here. So ATP is used by complex Y and it allows proton to come in. It's like flooding mechanism. Too much potential built, complex Y aids this process. Everything, structure, function, everything agrees beautifully. All right. And then porins and porters take water away. And the uncoupling protein, it produces heat by this has got a uh, uh, high amount of lysine arginine, which move the ROS outward and they react here. Superoxide, peroxide, hydroxyl radical all reacting among themselves to give water. So that is highly exothermic. You have heat generation, simple uh, homeostatic functional. Overall picture. So here is the picture again. Now you see you can easily get three ATP from ADP, whereas the classical theory says only 2.5. You can get even more. The energetic yield is very high. So excess negative species, the uh, they are all superoxide coenzyme Q, all that that gives the transmembrane potential. The neutralization of the charged species that are radical species. That gives thermogenesis. Thurgar movement, automatic movement of water gives homeostasis. So all these reactions are bimolecular, unordered process ensure spontaneity and thermodynamic viability. You see all these reactions, oxygen to water, when it goes complex one, complex two, all these reactions I have detailed step by step. They all add up beautifully. You can get here. You can see the kinetic viability of the ROS reacting among themselves. To give the rate constants or the um, you know equilibrium constants, you can see highly viable. What are the experimental evidence for what I'm saying? Now this is very interesting. I have shown in vitro. My students shown uh, showed it in IT Gaudi that if you take ADP and phosphate, just add superoxide, you get ADP. Very simple chemical. That is inhibited by science. This I showed it in two paper. And this work was demonstrated wonderfully by a uh, lady scientist, Kathleen Mailer, in 1990, wherein she took a mitochondria uh, so, uh, solution. And, you know, xanthine, xanthine oxidase is a uh, source of superoxide. When xanthine, xanthine oxidase was given to a mitochondrial su suspension, ATP production increased. But when you put SOD in that, the ATP production goes down. So direct evidence for my theory again. And then Mildred Cohn, uh, Galina Miro, uh, Mironova, all these lady scientists, wonderful demonstration. In 1950s, Cohn showed that when you use uh, OAT in experiments, multiple O atoms were inserted in the ATP. It's a radical reaction, right? That's how you get multiple uh, O18 insertion. And then uh, Galina Miranova from Russia had shown peroxidative, phosphor uh, peroxidative phosphorylation. My supports my argument. The most important thing is this, this if you can understand this image. ROS, reactive oxygen species. And the area, see, this is the ATP to ADP ratio. You want more ATP production. Okay. So ATP should be more. 
ATP production starts when 180 millivolts or 200 millivolts around that region. That is the region where you find raw source. So it is the raw that produces ATP, not the transmembrane production. See, it's like this. I can give you an example. You drive a scooter. Somebody drives a scooter. And there's a sound coming out of that scooter. There's smoke coming out of it. Do you say the smoke or the sound drives the scooter? That's what the current theory says. Something that can be equivalent to something that is not directly honest, something that is a byproduct, transmembrane potential. How does the transmembrane potential make? Transmembrane potential is a macroscopic thing. How does it get tapped and make phosphate and ADP bond? How? 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 It cannot. It doesn't. Whereas the involvement of loss. You can have simple bimolecular reactions that I showed in the earlier way. Tack, and then tack, tack. ADP, OP is ATP, phosphorylation. Very simple bimolecular reaction. Right? So, yeah. So, the higher NADH and oxygen you give, you get higher the reactive oxygen species. Increase in ROS elevates TMP. ATP production is not seen without ROS. So, and then complex 1 to 4, all of them generate ROS. And all of them bind to ADP. Even the elements supporting the more bond. All right. And you see, thermodynamic viability. Very viable. Their theory, it doesn't. Say, let us assess one, one by one reaction. The theory thermodynamically delta G is positive. Like I already talked about the discontinuum here. You see the structure, the pores, the non uh, root, all these are to deliberately generate ROS. Why should it have this pendulous matrix word extension? See, it's all beautiful bimolecular reactions giving rise to ATP. This thing has no role. In the new model, it has ADP binding sites. These are deliberately, you see, heme is exposed to solvent. This is supposed to be a complicated cycle uh, of 12 steps, the most unimaginable. In the photosynthesis, I'll come to that. It is there in the photosynthesis also. So this, in both, they are non-viable. Analysis, you do the basic breakdown, it doesn't work. And now, later structural studies have shown that they all come together as complexes. Hemoglobin, somebody asked me, yeah, in that, uh, from the uh, Isakimoto asked in the first thing. You see, these are all, this complex one is made of approximately 70 proteins. All right. So, all these are multiple proteins. They are super complex. This is a complex. That's why it's called complex. And then this is a super complex. Now, how can you explain the structure of super complex? Here, the classical theory is that coenzyme Q is supposed to come and bind here and take the electron. Why is then the, this coming and binding here? It cannot explain. On the other hand, if you explain, expect reactive oxygen species dynamics here, the beautifully things are explained. This have ROS apertures here. They come. They can all network. Here, this is a ADP binding site on this. This is a ROS producing center, ADP binding center. It can go here and there. So this is a stochastic scheme, multiple ADP binding sites, ROS production sites, matrix for distending, deliberate ploy for generating oxygen center reactive radicals. That's what I've said. So respirosomes aid ROS dynamics. Very importantly, it justifies the mobility of oxygen, the structure of cytochrome C. See, coenzyme Q. If coenzyme Q relays electron from complex 1 to complex 3, what would you expect? A coenzyme Q has isoprenoid chain from 1 to 10. 1 unit isoprenoid to 10 units. If it is motility that it is important, you would expect 1 or 2 or 3 to be involved more. But it is packed with coenzyme 10. 
cubic region is much much higher. So in my theory, this is cytochrome C and the coins and Q are random sponges, electron sponges placed in the lipid membrane and in the soluble phase. They absorb the electrons. So ET in micro heterogeneous milieu is dependent upon redox potentials, absolute relative concentrations, mobility, distance in part, uh, part, partitioning, stability, and not on deterministic mandates. There is no placement of electron transport chain proteins in a definite order. You have to sit like this, you have to take like this. Uh, ubiquinone is not dictated by anybody to say, okay, now I'm taking electrons from complex one. It is my moral dharma to take it to complex three. But why should it? That's what this believes. And it also believes that complex uh, four weights with oxygen to three molecules of the cytochrome C to come and give you one electron each, then four protons have been. Why? This model is something like a earth or the spontaneously assembled nuclear air. Moderation part by ubiquinone, all that, you know, the nuclear reactor spontaneously can, was assembled. Or a uh, earth, a chula, you know, no modularity is sought, just random distributions, but some fortuitous arrangements and events aid the overall outcomes. This is a very interesting model comparison. I'm not going into it in detail. I'll come to it later. And thermogenesis. You see, if there are students of physics here. Now, this is an exergonic reaction. NADH and oxygen is used by uh, these two proteins combined to drive protons out. Fine, exergonic. But then the protons, when they come back, the TMP is dissipated. When they come back by co complex five, the reaction is supposed to be the endergonic synthesis of ATP, but when it comes through the uncoupling protein, it is an exergonic process. How? Why? What is the basis? No basis. And the classical models were of many types. They, uh, they included uh, fatty acids, obligatory requirement, and proton shuttling multiple times. In the new model, the ROS that is present here, there are lysines and arginines here. They help the transport of the ROS into the next phase where they can easily access protons and they can form water. This is thermogenic reaction. All, there is no highly intelligent or this is the hallmark. Okay. Have you ever been um, interested in how cyanide kills? All right. This, if you pay five minutes attention here, you will understand this work and you'll be a follower of this theory. Now, the classical explanation for cyanide, how it kills, cyanide kills at milligrams per kg. Very low dose, all right? All right, suppose you have 50, you need to have up maybe 100 milligram, 50 kgs, it will knock you out. So, so milligrams per kg, or micromolar levels. The classical scheme requires cyanide to bind to the heme center, and the center it binds is complex four in mitochondria, it's supposed to. And then it is suppose if you have to have binding like that, you need to have grams per kg, thousand times the lethal dose that is known. So explaining because I asked you a question in Mansarovar, the um, uh, you know the uh, four elephants, that question. The kinetics part, the one-to-one -one correlation. One-to-one -one correlation, there is cyanide binding to him. You can see high amount of cyanide, you get it to bind to him. But then, that's it. Justify the quantify, uh, quantifiable aspects, the thermodynamics, the one-to-one uh, -one stoichiometry, the kinetics. See, if you compute, the, calculate the amount of cells in cytochrome oxidase or hemoglobin and all that, that vastly exceeds the amount of cyanide that is given into the body. One by hundredth or one by thousand is taken by the cyanide. Cyanide needs one to one binding, right? Even if you consider 100% efficiency binding, you still have a lot of those proteins remaining. Why should it be a problem? In my theory, what I'm saying is 
It's not the oxygen that is required. It is the ROS that is required because cyanide reacts with the ROS making water and these reactions are bimolecular, very fast, 10 to the power 10 per molar per second and the delta G, the equilibrium constant lies far to right. That's the reason. What is the evidence for it? The next slide is the evidence. Equilibrium and binding constants. This is the carbon monoxide binding and equilibrium constant. This is the cyanide binding. Now, if you know smokers, smokers have 10% easily carbon monoxide in their blood. Cyanide kills at 2 to 3%. Anybody from chemistry will tell you that carbon monoxide is a much, much, much stronger binding ligand of heme than cyanide. Cyanide goes off and on. Carbon monoxide binds and sticks there for a longer time. Than cyanide. How do you think that these are even H2S, ammonia, all of them are much higher? Once again, here also the Km value is less than Kd. How can IC50 be less than Kd? It doesn't abide by the classical theory at all. So, like I said, carbon, oxy, carbon monoxide knocks out only above 40%, whereas cyanide kills at 2 to 3%. And even if you so you, you say you take the K1 value of carbon monoxide, you see it's, the oxygen has got at least 10,000 times more value, not 10,000, 1,000 times more. This is 10, 4, this is 8. So 1,000 times at least more. The kinetics show that the oxygen can easily beat um, uh, cyanide. See, 6 times more than, 10 to power 6 times, not 6 times, 10 to power 6 times. So, in fact, the number don't agree. One to one correlation, if you just give me an argument, it doesn't. It doesn't justify the thermodynamics, kinetics, the numbers. So, here you have a fundamental problem wherein the cyanide explained this explanation was published in toxicology with a special editor's forward, the leading journal in the world, LCDH. So, I'm not blah, 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 blah. It's all there out there. If you have even a little interest in biology, you can go and check. You can take it to your teachers. You can take it to anybody you want. I challenge, open. Nobody can bring a counter to this. So the overall cellular physiology is like this now. That is, conventional perception is fatty acid. Uh, in the adipocytes, fatty acids are produced and the mitochondria uh, dissipation of heat, toxic wasteful ROS, signaling aging pathology. No, the new Murban perspective is mitochondrial metabolism, ROS generation, heat and water, heat conservation by adipose tissue, energy homeostasis, and ROS plus lipid biomolecules signaling byproducts, aging and apoptosis, cancer and diseases. This is the new perspective whole paradigm has shifted. All right, so oxygen is the elixir of life. It can give life, take life, order, chaos. All right, it's the Batman character. So we have to jettison the terms electron transport chain, the recognized ideas of chemiosmosis, proton multiforce, and rotary adhesives. They should be taken out of our textbooks, and India should do it first. And we should not look westward for them to correct it. That's not going to happen. If a teacher comes and teaches this, you need to question it. And that's it. So what is the paradigm shift here? Did you get the paradigm shift? If you are a researcher in biology, you cannot consider ROS a problem. Things are the problem if they are greater in number, are not at the right place, not at the right time. Oxygen is needed to make drugs, not for anything. I will show you so many other examples after this, tomorrow also, which will conclusively drive home my point. If you imagine that oxygen is needed to make water, 
then why why would you need it within uh, two minutes within two minutes if it doesn't come you're gone you why the cyanide is a conclusive argument and when you see uh, a question iron is that involved is all involved in electrophysiology also it's involved in vision how do you see me it's involved everything involves this so how what does a cell do a cell has got functions of powering i can do this i can look at you i can see i can do all that because i am getting power then i remain coherent my cells different parts connect i act as a one unit that's coherence then uh, homeostasis i retain my integrity in the sense some molecules ions are in a particular concentration and the volume is a particular amount that is homeostasis then electromechanical activities i demonstrate as a cell i am speaking like a cell then uh, sensing and response everything needs and it's not to make what not to make and do you think this is something that the world can sit upon covid took the warning when i came covid new strain what is covid the respiratory distress ultimately right it leads to respiratory yeah yes or no yeah yeah so when they administered excess oxygen it was creating more problems what is oxygen group when you know what something does you can devise better strategies to approach what it's supposed to give when you don't know what it does you ask anybody what is the role of oxygen ask a surgeon ask a physician ask a scientist they don't know how can making water at complex four be the function of oxygen after sitting through this class do you think this work should sit undiscussed when our generations of people are dying the generations are working for cancer research and all that not properly oriented drugs are getting standardized without any idea it's sad well i thank uh, nikolai mikhailovich bajin uh, and uh, surjit ramaswamy for these works uh, bajin wrote to me after he saw my works he also questioned he is a russian academy of sciences professor is 85 years old okay. so yeah we collaborate even now. so i i i get very upset at the end of this particular talk because um, it's so annoying that people like to maintain status quo for no reason what it's the interest of some people that this is still being taught i published these books 5 6 years back that paper is the most well read the paper was this that journal was discontinued the editor was fired for publishing it this is harsh reality i am being political i know yes please so this oxidative phosphorylation and the mitochondrial membrane and uh, you know its connection with uh, the ros is well as its connection with uh, 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 corporate mold formation it is well understood but similar reaction also happens at the uh, cell membrane level there are several kinases which are i think in the lovely cell. lovely question lovely question that's what my paper on uh, post translational modification was just published last month that's what i'm saying that will come in the last the last day next day it will come very good question we approach see i get goosebumps very good question see this is we look at certain things and we interpret that this is done by that kinase for this thing some things are harmless modifications it is consequence of this thing but it's a paper yes. somebody write something we need to look at things and try to this now what is there is so much information overload and everybody uh, professor venkatesh said in the beginning of this you know people don't look at large picture everybody has a small space where i add 2 plus 2 and say it is 3 somebody else will add 2 plus 2 and say it is 5 and somebody will say 2 plus 3 is 4 and all of us are supposed to be you are right you are right i stick to this 
we are supposed to be politically right. Yeah, I don't care. Anyway, I'm not employed. Yeah. So uh, one question from Akanksha online. So according to this theory, there is no TMP in the mitochondrial membrane. Oh, no, 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 no. There is TMP. The, the, see, you should understand Akanksha. TMP is a two-point concept. It's not in the membrane. You have to use the word properly. You have to understand the concepts properly. Transmembrane potential voltage is measured across two points. All right. So transmembrane potential is an experimental observation. I have never denied it. Please see this, this slide. Uh, let us let us very clearly get to the aspect. There is a transmembrane potential. Now the attribution that transmembrane potential is what drives ATP synthesis is the questioning. The point that is to be questioned. The transmembrane potential results because of oxygen centered negative radicals and ions and co coenzyme Q centered negative radicals and ions. So now that thing, uh, when oxygen centered radicals get attacked and neutralized by the protons that come in, you have ATP synthesis. So did I answer the question, Ms. Akanksha or Dr. Akanksha or Professor Akanksha? I don't know. What? I hope that question. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So I have a question. Yes. So I sometimes get interested in about biology. Yes. yes. So three people offer it. People offer friends and seniors. Come here, no? Come and talk here. Come and because. The other people can also listen to our conversation. No, no. I do not have a very strong, I don't have a strong base to question. Just I know a few things. I know one thing there is a thing called cell motor. Many people are saying mm -hmm. and doing research. So what do you think uh, cell motor and this concept? Cell motor. Yeah, they're saying there is small uh, motor colors units that. Protein. Yeah. I said there is complex file is supposed to be a. There is nothing like that. Tomorrow, I, I will talk about bacterial flagella, another rotor. There's nothing. That, I'm proving that to you. Now, everything is going to change. Bacterial flagella goes round and round. Imagine if something were to be like that. Would it mock evolution or not? Do you like evolution as a theory? Do you think it is evidenced? Can you have evolution at at the same level, and you can believe in the rotary function of bacterial flagella. Can you imagine? Does it correlate with your idea of reality? You imagine if flagella is such a flexible kind of a thing. Okay. Now it some somehow rotates. Just imagine that it rotates. How can you see yourself translating that rotary movement? Multiple flagella, one flagella. You know, very rigid flagella all that how do how does it and you know what tomorrow uh, that's a very good question once again i tell you the bacterial flagella rotary thing is supposed to be a left hand screw you know what a left hand screw is and that left hand screw when it's rotating counterclockwise it is supposed to push the bacteria forward right now you take a left hand screw take a right hand screw or a left hand screw try to do that it was funny. <laughs> One simple thing. Do for some hundreds of paper in nature, um, uh, uh, PMAs, they can publish. You send one try paper trying to critique question. So my question was, yeah, uh, this cell, what do you think of this cell motor? Is it? No, it is not a rational and mocking. It is not. It is not. It cannot. See, motor, rotor, uh, generator V made, V made, V made, and it it needs electromagnetic energy because there nothing is touching anything, brushes and all that. We can this you can have that rotary motion. Here this is piercing one membrane cell wall. This so, uh, five different phases, and it has to go rotate. Uh, so either say rotate. If you have to rotate from here, kya pakar ke rotate karna? How can it rotate? Protons come in. Yeah, protons come in and it rotate. So now you have a you have a chucky, you you put grain from the top and then you rotate and then you get um, a powder bit. 
you put what here you it's like putting powder on the front and the chakki goes around what what is happening i i cannot relate see if if you don't relate it na relate with something na question and then you try to get into the depth of it it's a good question so what i'm saying is here the rotary function doesn't okay yeah, that that conclusively have demonstrated see in science what can you do you can disprove i disproved it we found out the, the the best thing is you know the bacterial flagella is 20 nanometer thick the liquid that you will use to visualize it has to be minimally 200 nanometers where is the resolution to say that it rotates rotation is around its axis it's not spiral movement it's not uh, revolution rotation is a totally different thing from the starting to the end it has to go around it for for yeah oh, bhogna is asking will the antioxidants present in the cell interface with the catalytic effect of morzine uh, by scavenging ross interference sir will the antioxidants present in the cell, in cell interfere with the catalytic efficiency of morzine by scavenging ross well we are now entering a phase of exploration of the interactive equilibrium symbiont what i have shown with my works is these kinds of equilibrium have to be explored now when they try to in experimental systems in experimental animals when they try to barrage with antioxidants and all that it's not very good when they don't give to uh, when you take antioxidants it's not good everything has an optimal yeah. what antioxidant is present where at what time is what comes and rather than looking at it like this is bad with that approach we should try target rather what is needed where how does it work what is the concentration range what is the dynamics what are the forces what are the principles in that's not being done we have a blanket approach in this what is the self regulatory mechanism for ross control it, it gets generated then where do they go oh yeah that's 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 something that we need to try to target in the future now what i'm showing you now is in the uh, talks tomorrow also the proteins they will have a uh, preferable so now you, you, you remember you saw this picture now see here there is this ross dynamics right all these continuously evolve they try to minimize the ross distribution all right so that see here the ross that sorry the ross that is produced here can help here so do you understand what i'm saying and when they come together the probability of ross getting localized is okay. so now several tetrameric proteins or uh, polymeric proteins there was no reason why they were polymeric protein now there is a reason for it do you understand the point why why do proteins come together lactate has this tetrameric why is uh, uh, hemoglobin tetrameric i will show you it took in, in tomorrow's lecture i am going to talk to you about that so i uh, am addressing your question only in the sense uh, how do the ross dynamics where it is produced where it goes those are the things that we need rather than it doesn't happen it gets produced by some wasteful method like that it is the elixir of life how is it produced where does it go how does what are the equilibrium symbol that is what will save lives that now the average life expectancy is around 60 70 now i project that with murbon concepts uh, relevance reaching out to people please easily become 90 easily 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 how yeah. how 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 that's a good question now uh, when you know see i'm a scientist right you are the engineer you'll find what's wrong yeah. i explain i explain and then once you know how did you know what and all we have done the kind of things that amit does with the artificial intelligence and all that the kind of things that we develop once we know the basic principles now it's like this 
blind men saying, ah, it's like a pillar, it's like a wall. And then one bit of a light. And you see the elephant, you can manage the elephant easily. You are very smart. Yeah. You also artificial intelligence. Yes, right. You are training all of us. Yes. How to interpret the upper end. That's it. That's it. Then you are sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Real intelligence. Not artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Artificial intelligence is like a charming. Yeah, yeah. Artificial intelligence, there is no real intelligence. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree, Mahavir? I don't know. I can. You have a question. Actually. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, I saw you. Yes, sorry. Please come here, no? Learn to face the people. I like all my people to have the guts to face people with their doubts. Never sit with your doubts. Yeah. So, sir, like you were saying, like uh, what I understand, you were saying that the bacterial motion, you were saying that that place, that rotation, like whatever motion is happening, is not safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not like we have any other like you know, explanation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. That's come tomorrow to my lecture. Okay. But it's a jet propulsion kind of a thing. What you know that uh, kite kite has a long tail, right? What does it do? It stabilizes. Otherwise, if you have a small molecule, it has water getting thrown out, right? Mm. It's a type three secretory system. If you know my, my, my microbiology, anybody here? Good. So type three secretory system. So, uh, no, secretory system, do you know? Yeah, bacteria, they also conjugate. Yeah, phylus, you know? Uh -huh. Phylus, yes, right? And the genetic material and all that, they transfer, right? Yes. Same kind of a thing. It is something that moves things up. You know, you have a, a hot water production, something like that. It goes out. But then what will that do? It will give a tumbling kind of a motion. Now, you put a stabilizer there. How in the kite, you put a stabilizer, not long tail. Right. It's like when I was, uh, in the space ship, they have those air jets. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of something like that. But then that uh, that jet, there is there is no real uh, stabilizer. It, 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 they control and then they stabilize with. So, Flesla sort of kind of becomes like a radar, like, you know, radar, ship's radar, like, you know. Yeah, well, that is what, that is the document okay. that I'm proofing you. Yes, that's what it does. And there's only one paper. Vidhu Soman, he didn't come today. So he did PhD on this work. And when he started, I said, this, I don't believe. But he did his PhD, he got his PhD, good. Uh, but now he's authored the paper with me and he agrees. So that's what it is. Basically, it is, it has to be that. There's one, one paper uh, by some two American professors who uh, works for the jet propulsion they just said that it is possible because it's a low rate on some regime yeah. so uh, you move forward and if you move backward it, it will get stuck the same place you know they, it, it doesn't like work like normal uh, our movements now rowing function mm -hmm. kind of so but then i am very convinced that the rotating thing is absolutely all right how these people change you know it's sad first the Searing was the rotary thing. Okay, searing. There was a searing protein. Yes, yes. Yeah, you know, you are from that area? Yeah, like I have one little water. Yeah, first searing. That was a rotor. Then they realized that is not because they mutated all that. Then nothing was getting affected. Then there was a mott protein, stubby, kuti kuti things on top. Yeah. And then uh, they said, oh, that is the rotor. Well, and then it has got one amino acid, okay? One amino acid, one aspartate somewhere, somewhere sitting. And that is supposed to rotate the whole thing. And I'm full of mockery. I, I do not intend to be, um, you know, considerate to these people. Because they, they have, this was proposed by Howard Burke. To his soul, may it rest in peace. He died last year. There is no, because in 1970s, this rotary thing came and this Peter Mitchell uh, uh, proton thing came. And these people took the whole world on rotation, 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 proton pump, proton pump, proton pump. And you don't know what it did to human civilization. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. I'm, I'm upset, terribly upset. It's a mockery of our intelligence. It's a mockery of our intelligence. We should challenge it. We should challenge it. How can anything rotate? 
naturally assembled. Can you imagine? We try, man. You try to get something to rotate. For one moment, it sticks and it just falls apart and it goes out. You try to make anything to rotate. It's not, and it not just rotates. It rotates this way, it rotates that way. So anyway, so I hope I answered your question. Next, uh, last talk. Oh uh, yeah, last talk. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask some? Please, please, please. please. Uh, yeah, please, please. Yeah. That is the whole point. You know, you're going? Okay. 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 One is that uh, I have I did not deliberately put it in this talk to avoid the uh, confusion that might generate. But then I can I can tell you it was in the uh, uh, that paper was published. Now. It's a very good question. Okay, okay. Now here uh, it basically uh, ATP binds. Here it has got all these alpha beta have shown that they have multiple ADP and ATP binding sites. Right? All boy completely overlooked this reality. Chose to see only one beta binding site, ATP binding site on this. And then he said they go in taco, 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 rotating way. Now, this all these are multiple ADP binding sites. Not only that, this, this, this thing here, this epsilon, it has an ATP binding site. Now, what the first uh, role for complex phi is this ATP, it's a clear ATP, ATP base. Now, ATP base binds, opens the pore here. And lots of literature, it's a proton pore. So, this is proton deficient, this system, right? You want water to get formed. Otherwise, the negative charge will start building up, right? So, ATP is used to open this, and then the system homeostasis and the equilibrium once again get formed. That's one role, okay? Second role is here, the, uh, this has got multiple ADP binding sites, right? It can just sit there, and the, um, rods that are going here and there, they can also attack it and then protons are coming. It can also serve as a secondary ATP synthesis. Okay. But not at all by a rotation mechanism. I know that is fine. Mm -hmm. No, I was just thinking to tie in with what you said with the chloroperoxidase. Maybe the binding is not that critical. So yeah. that's why the differential ATP, ADP so that Absolutely. sort of aligns with your yeah, earlier yeah. proposal. Yes, right. That, you are on the right track, correct? I did not put it in this. Okay. For, for what complex phase role is here, because I thought it will unnecessarily complicate issues. Yeah, anything else? Other thing is how easy, I mean, I cannot envision protons going very readily through the membrane. Yes. So what is the cost for that in the model? Well, now, protons don't go in. Right. If you see my model, what I'm saying is, look. Yeah, this have, what no, is no, this that? This, huh? now, now, this thing, this thing, they say, this is not really proton permeable. This is an experimental yes, yeah. Now, why is it not? It is not because this is highly packed with proteins. That's the reason. Now, this is, everybody agrees that this is proton permeable. Now, we don't have magic anything working here. These are simple chemicals. These are, now, proton has a uh, permeability, small amount. It has got still lesser amount. So, now, what I'm saying is, Proton can go here, but complex phi is a major proton entry point. And you cannot really prevent proton from coming from here. But when it comes from here, coenzyme Q, which is reduced, which is proton deficient, will take that. Right? That's what. These two sponges there. Now, you understand what is happening. It's a burning reaction that is happening. It's a statistically, you know, perpetuating reaction. Controlled, controlled, moderated. 
So it that's why you know it it escaped everybody's attention because everybody was looking at enzyme linked uh, defined defined stoichiometry and all that. Nobody really bothered to think of the system in a bigger, broader perspective. So the last system, can we go to the next system? Finish this session because uh, the session was supposed to end at 1.30. Right. Yes. So I'll go to the photosynthesis thing. Sure. Can I go? I think uh, they will have to go for their to their hostels for lunch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have a deadline of what time is it? One thirty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I have just finished this quickly. Then actually, this was very information intensive. But then you will like how many engineers here? Electrical engineers here? Wow, lovely. This you will like. Photosynthesis you will like. This is my favorite thing to mock. And you know what? I'm a biologist, not trained in all this. I like uh, uh, to see uh, you know Jacques Cousteau's. Secrets of the sea, and that's the reason why I start. Uh, um, <laughs> my my student gave this computer to me with this new college, and in why is it saying? Okay. All right. So this is the last talk of the day. <laughs>